Hello and welcome to the Slackware Arm vlog. Before we get started, I need to make a little hardware modification to the NAS case. You can buy this case from the Pine64 website and inside has my Rock Pro 64. I made a video a few months ago where I assembled this, but I haven't done anything else with it since then. And when I came to begin um, this episode and, and actually uh, installing this machine, the way I'd set it up was that I put the um, USB to serial cable. Uh, I wired it through the hole at the front because there's already an existing hole. So I thought that was a good idea. So the problem was that it was just laying across the fan like that. And I could have used a wire tie to keep it away, but I figured the safest thing to do is to simply drill a hole on this side and just feed it through there and attach it back to the, um, to the pins there. So that's what we're gonna do. Almost there. Okay, so I have it back here uh, in my office and really the purpose of this episode is to install uh, Slackware ARCH64 Current, which is the development branch, onto this Rock Pro 64. And this is because eventually this will replace my Orange Pi Plus 2E that I use for my um, home gateway machine. So an Orange Pi Plus 2E looks a little bit, uh, where is he, uh, like this. This is an Orange Pi Plus 2E. It's a really small 32-bit ARM board. And this has two gigs of RAM. I use one of these as my home gateway machine um, to do natting and everything else. So the thing about this is, and this is also one of the reasons why I no longer develop the 32-bit ARM board, is because... This only has USB version 2, which has a much slower data rate than USB 3. And the issue with that is that when you've got fiber to the premises, like I do, you can't get the full speed out of the fiber. So at the moment, I'm paying for a speed that I can't utilize. Um, so I'm looking forward to being able to replace this with the Rock Pro 64. Now, the thing about the Rock Pro 64 is that, as you can see, it has uh, two USB 2 ports, which are, the, which are the white ones, and it has a blue USB 3 port and a USB-C port, which is the smaller one at the bottom. And on the reverse, it has just an Ethernet port and HDMI and the power. Now, what this means is that, and this is where, and this is where the issue comes in for the Orange Pi Plus 2E because the Orange Pi Plus 2E has a network port, a gigabit network port and USB. But the way that my NAS is set, well, in fact, this is the same for anyone really. So with fiber to the premises, you have ethernet presented to, um, into the premises. So you have fiber, then it has an ethernet presentation on the end of it, into which you connect your router, or in my case, the router is a Linux box on an Orange Pi Plus 2E. So that side sorted out. But what about the internal network? I'm not using Wi-Fi on this, so I don't use Wi-Fi. Um, at least not, not, for the, not for that network. So that means I need an additional adapter to connect to the wired Ethernet. So I've got one Ethernet port for the uplink to the ISP and the other into the, uh, into the local network. The way I've accomplished that with this is to just use a USB dongle. 
And that's where we hit the speed limitation with the USB 2 interface. So on the Rock Pro 64, what I'm going to do is connect the um, onboard Ethernet to the uh, LAN into a gigabit switch. And I'm going to connect the uplink uh, to the ISP, to the Ethernet presentation, via a USB-C to gigabit dongle. Once we release Slackware 15.1, I will migrate my home gateway over to this machine. Before I'm comfortable replacing my Orange Pi Plus 2E with the Rock Pro 64, I need to thoroughly soak test it, which means that I'm going to be putting it through its paces. I want to make sure that the board is stable. I know that my build machines uh, for the Slackware project are stable. They've been building now for since I started the 64-bit ports. So those, I'm really happy with those machines, but this particular one, it's brand new, it's never been switched on, and I want to make sure that it's stable before I replace my, um, my, my, my Orange Pi Plus 2E. So I'm going to, um, I need to soak test the machine itself to make sure that it's stable, that everything works properly on the board. I'll also be soak testing the uh, SATA cable, or rather the SATA card that connects to the SSD, and the ethernet, and the USB dongle. Um, and once I've been soak testing those, uh, then I'll be happy that this machine is stable and I can switch it over when we do the release. Now, how are we gonna soak test it? I'm going to install this machine and make it the primary builder machine for Slackware Aarch 64, because those machines, believe you me, get hammered pretty much all day, every day, 24 seven. And that's because they're running compile jobs um, pretty much 24 by seven. So we'll get the CPU and the RAM tested, we'll get the SATA card tested, and the Ethernet will also be tested uh, because I'll make this the default, I'll make this ETH0, so it'll be the, it will become the primary um, uh, Ethernet port. And the SATA drive will be tested as well because it's, um, the, the, the local drive is used to unpack all the source code and everything like that. So once this machine's been in use and building packages for about three weeks or so, I'll be pretty confident that I can um, put it into production as my home gateway machine. Okay, so the first thing that we need to do is to wire up the uh, uh, serial cable, the serial connectors here, because I disconnected it, of course, to place it through, through the freshly drilled hole. Um, it is worth noting that you don't have to use a serial cable for your Rock Pro 64. In fact, when you read the documentation, you'll see that the serial console stuff is at the very foot of the document. And the documentation only refers to installing it using a keyboard and monitor. But I always have a serial connector on mine because, um, mostly because it's easy to, to debug the machines, but also because I reinstall them remotely. I don't go and sit at them. I just have a, I just uh, SSH to a box and I control the installer over the serial. It's just easier for me. So the first thing we need to do is reconnect this. And of course, I can't remember what the pin, <laughs> what the pin layout is, but fortunately it's in the Slackware ARM documentation. So let's have a quick look at that. Okay. So the easiest way to find the documentation is to go to arm.slackware.com. Okay. Then on the left hand side, you'll see the installation section and install guides. So click on the install guides link. At the moment, there isn't a stable release of Slackware 15.1 for Aarch 64. So you'll have to look at the current installation guides. Okay, and we're looking for the Rock Pro 64. So we click on that one. Now at the very bottom of, the, of here, of this guide is the uh, there it is the serial information so we can see that it needs to be uh, black white and green in that order and i think it's the second pin down no, actually i could just click on the link there we go right yeah so it's these pins here i don't know if you can actually see that but no, probably not. But though, so it's leaving two pins on the top left and then it's work your way to the right. Okay, so next we need a micro SD card. To begin, we will copy the uh, bootloader flashing tool onto this and then we'll flash 
the bootloader onto the Rock Pro 64. Then we will copy the Slackware installer onto it and boot the Slackware installer and then install Slackware. And at which point this micro SD card will become part of the operating system. Uh, it'll become the boot partition of the OS. So you'll need to leave it inside of your Rock Pro 64. If you want to get um, fancy and customize things, then you can do without the SD card, but I've not documented that. So you'd be on your own with that one. It really is best to just follow the installation guide because it, it lays out nicely everything you need to do to get Slackware working on the Rock Pro 64. And the first thing we need to do is get my Linux box. I suppose I could do it from here actually, uh, but we'll do it from, so I've got, I've left it in a virtual console. So let's just switch it over. This is difficult doing this one handed. <laughs> there we go. Right, so we've got ourselves the KDE desktop. Okay. So if we refer to the Slackware installation guide, you'll see there's a section called installing the bootloader to SPI flash. Now it talks about jumpering, bridging pins 23 and 25. Because this is a brand new, never before been switched on um, Rock Pro 64, there is no bootloader in the SPI flash. So I don't need to bypass anything. The only reason why you want to bypass the bootloader is if there's an existing bootloader installed that has a particular configuration that prevents it from booting from the SD card by default. But because there isn't one, I know that from the factory they come with nothing at all, then um, the, the um, embedded firmware will boot from an SD card initially. So in this instance, we actually don't need to bridge the pins. I'd be very surprised if that's changed from the other Opera 64. So I'm pretty confident that we don't need to. So I, I don't need to follow that section or those specific, um, that's those specific uh, instructions there. But we do need to copy the flashing tool onto the micro SD card. So I'll insert the micro SD card into my adapter and plug it into my machine here. Okay, and like that. Okay, oh yeah, D message is turned off by default. So switch myself to the root user of my Linux box. Tail. And of course it doesn't like it. <laughs> right, okay, let's try the other one. Okay, for some reason, that's interesting. So for some reason, the second USB port on my x86 machine isn't happy, but okay, never mind. The first one is. So, uh, yeah, so this micro SD card already has something on it from a previous, um, I think from the Pinebook Pro uh, installation, actually. So that's fine. Um, in your case, you need to be careful about what you're going to overwrite and, you know, Okay, so I'm gonna blow away everything on this SD card because I know that I don't need it. In the installation guide, it walks you through downloading the Slackware installer and the um, bootloader flashing tool. But in my case, I don't need to download them because I have the master tree at home available on this machine. So platform arc bootware recovery uh, RK3399. There it is. So I do need the instructions though. So XZCAT, like, oh, it's, oh yes. So this little instruction there, let's prefix that, is just wiping out the um, partition table. So in my case, well, it's doing more than that. It's wiping, it's wiping out more than just the partition table, but it's basically clearing um, how many, like, 100, oh no, 10 megs. It's clearing out 10 megs off the SD card. It's more than enough to clear out partition tables and other stuff. Um, so dev SDA and counts equals. Now, again, as I say in my other videos, be very careful. Don't just follow anything I'm doing in a video because my, you know, what I'm actually doing here is live and it's on my specific systems. SDA on most of your machines is probably your um, primary hard disk or primary storage. But on my case, this x86 machine runs off of NF 
runs off of NMVE. Um, so SDA is unoccupied. Well, actually, it's occupied now because it's occupied by the SD card. So make sure you always double check that. As you can see, I'm highlighting up here that the SDA is the 32 gig um, storage device, which is the uh, um, which is the micro SD card. So OF equals SDA. OK, that's fine. OK, and then we just need to flash it. So we'll flash that like that. SDA. Rock Pro 64. It's definitely the Rock Pro. Yep. OK. Sync. OK, so that's has now been written to the storage and I can safely eject it or disconnect it from the PC. There. Now it's ready to be inserted into the Rock Pro 64. Next, I need to connect the HDMI cable to the Rock Pro 64 so we can see what's going on on the screen. Next, we need to insert the micro SD card into the slot, which is on the side. Uh, yeah, this is the only thing about this case is that it's quite difficult to. Um, no, there we go. There we go. Okay, that's in there. Uh, we need to power it up. So I'm going to be using the uh, what, which what is it? It's the twelve volt five amp um, PSU that you can buy with it from the Pine64 store. Uh, so switch my KVM to that one. Just then connect the power, it's booting. So this is now booting the, there we go. So this has booted the firmware flashing tool or rather the bootloader flashing tool. And it's just waiting for 15 seconds to give you the time to disconnect the jumper if you'd jump with the pins. But again, I didn't uh, because you don't need to on fresh uh, Rock Pro 64s because there's nothing to bypass. There is no existing bootloader. So it's erasing the SPI flash now and then it will write it. Now, the thing about this, which I want to point out, is that you'll see that there's nothing other than the HDMI and the power connected to it. I don't I don't even have the um, where did it go? Oh, here it is. I don't even have the uh, USB to serial adapter plugged in. This is because the I've noticed that when you have USB connected peripherals, although admittedly this actually isn't USB because it's not connected. Well, it's USB, but it's not connected to the USB bus of the Rock Pro 64. Um, but nonetheless, I just haven't connected it yet. Anyway, my point is, is that when you flash the uh, bootloader, have the minimum set of peripherals connected because I found that if you have, say, a USB keyboard or a storage device plugged in, um, it tends to cause the process to hang sometimes. So this is why I've not got anything connected. The SATA um, uh, board is fine though, but it just seems to be USB um, peripherals that give a bit of a trouble. Once you've got the, once you've flashed this and it works, it's fine. You can leave the USB peripherals connected, but during the initial flashing process, you should keep those USB devices disconnected. All right. Okay, so you can see now that it has flashed the uh, U-Boot bootloader to SPI. It says process complete, you may now power off. Great. Okay. So the next step, I haven't actually powered this off yet. I've just switched the um, uh, KVM from the Rock Pro 64 back to my x86. Okay, so the next thing we need to do is remove the micro SD card from my, well actually we can power it off, why not? Is to remove the micro SD card from the Rock Pro 64 because we now need to write the Slackware installer to this SD card. So I'll put that back into the adapter, put that back into the first USB socket like that. Okay. 
Right. Okay, so the message tail. All right, so you can see again that our SDA is back, and this time it has three partitions on it rather than just two, because that's the number of partitions on the um, uh, on the flashing tool image. Right, so the next step is to write the Slackware installer onto this SD card so we can boot it on the Rock Pro 64. So we've done that. So let's go back to our install guide. All right, so the next thing to do is write the Slackware installer. So I'm going to just copy this. And again, you should follow the instructions as laid out here, but I'm gonna move around a bit because I know what I'm doing. And uh, I wanna make this video a little bit um, shorter than the full installation guide. If you want the full installation guide, uh, there is a, a video of it. Admittedly, it's now over a year and a half old. So the installation process has changed a little bit. Um, it's, it's easier now than it used to be, but basically it still covers probably 90, it's probably 90, 7% the same. <laughs> so it's fine if you can we can watch the video if you want to. Okay. So we want XZ cat uh, this one the generic and then pipe it into DD SDA like that. And you can also do a time as well. Okay, so um, so I'm unpacking so what I'm doing here on the command line is Make that a little bit bigger. So I could also enlarge the font, I suppose. That might, that might be helpful for you, mightn't it? Okay, so um, I'm using the Unix time command that will report back how long the uh, invocation of the following process took. I'm using xzcat to unpack the Slackware um, installer package for the RK3399, which is the name of the system on chip that the Rock Pro 64 uses. Um, so that's the generic package for the Rock Pro 64. So then it pipes it into DD and um, dumps it onto the disk. So that looks good to me. Um, now you'll notice maybe for the eagle-eyed viewers amongst you that RK3399 generic is not what it's written in here. In here it's written slkaio.image. That's just because the install guides, uh, when you download it, off the distribution server, you save it with this file name. It just makes the documentation easier, that's all. So that's why it's a different name in case you'd noticed. Okay, so this is now writing and this will take us a few minutes. All right, so that's completed and you can see it's transferred about 11 gigabytes. It took eight minutes more or less, as you can see here. Yeah, eight minutes. Okay, so let's do sync to make sure the data is synced, which it obviously is because it responded immediately. Okay, and we can now remove the SD card from the adapter and once again insert it into the Rock Pro 64. Pin side up. Okay, so switch that KVM back onto the Rock Pro 64 and oh yes, this time I'm going to I think that's the right one. So the KVM has uh, video, of course, and a USB keyboard. So it should attach this keyboard to it. So I'll just plug the keyboard into one of these USB 2 ports here at the front. And then plug the power in as well. There we go. You'll see I don't have an Ethernet cable connected here uh, because we don't need to. Because of the way that Slackware is packaged on ARM, you can perform an offline installation. Okay, so you can see that the Slackware installer is booting here. So it's just retrieving the installer image, loading the kernel, and there we go. So yeah, there is no ethernet connected in here. I haven't also still yet connected the serial cable. I'm not going to either for this install video. I'll just keep it as it is in the documentation. So we'll do this with the keyboard and monitor. Okay, so the installer, or well, the kernel is booting. It will try to acquire a DHCP lease over the network, but there is no network connection, so it won't work. So, 
just have to wait for that to time out. Okay, there we go. So the installer is now ready. So we just press enter. You can see that the font size has now increased. So you can hopefully read it a lot better than you could otherwise. So I'll select myself a key map. I'm gonna pick the UK map and press one again to do that. Now, this is the point at which when I'd ordinarily SSH into it, into the installer, or I would um, use a serial cable, I could just show you the screen recording directly, but because we don't have that facility right now, we'll have to just point to you at the uh, monitor itself. So let's see what we have here. So we have, uh, okay, so we have MTD0, which is the SPI flash. We've got SDA, which is the SSD drive connected to the SATA controller. And we have MMC BLK1, which is the 32 gig micro SD card. Okay. So SDA is going to be our storage and there are currently, doesn't look like there are any partitions on it at all. F -disk, F -disk, S -D -A, P, no, there's nothing. So what we're gonna do is create a swap partition first. CF disk is in the installer, so you can use it if you wish. I am an F disk guy, I've always used F disk, so I'm gonna use F disk. So um, N for new partition, P, to make it a primary partition, just press enter. Partition number is one, so it's the default. First sector is that one. And last sector, I'm gonna make my swap partition eight gig. You don't need an eight gigabyte swap partition. It's just that because this is going to be a build machine, I do need uh, copious amounts of swap space one of the build machines was sitting at seven gigs of swap used because it was building like QT or something. Uh, building some of these open source projects requires huge amounts of RAM. And this has only uh, four gigs of RAM, the Rock Pro 64. So when it comes to particularly the linking process, um, you'd, <laughs> you know, it does tend to consume swap space. So for this build machine, I'll set it to be an eight gigabyte swap partition, but you can probably just get away with two or maybe even one gigabyte. I'm now going to change the type of it to 82, which is Linux swap. If you look P, print partitions, you'll now see we have a single partition of size eight gigabytes of type Linux swap. Press N to create another one. Press P for, again, it's gonna be a primary. Press two, we'll just press enter to accept that it's gonna be the second partition. First sector will continue after the last, or rather the end of the first partition. So we'll just accept the defaults and then just press enter to accept the last like that. And then just press A to make um, partition two bootable, which actually I don't think you need to do one arm, but I do it anyway as, a hangover from x86. <laughs> I've never tried not, I know, I think I have tried not doing that, but anyway, that's what I do. So in the end, you'll see that we've got two partitions. The first is a swap partition, and the second is the remainder of the um, storage available on the SSD, which equates to 215 gigs. Okay, and we can now write that partition table, like that with W. Now, don't worry, you're not expected to just follow this video and know how to do this. All of these steps are fully documented in the install guide, it's really easy. So now we just type in the command setup like this. Okay, and we can, we've already set the key map so we don't need to do that. We press enter on add swap, it automatically detects our eight gigabyte swap partition. Uh, I don't need to scan for bad blocks. If you're attaching a um, a known, well, kind of an unknown or old hard disk to these machines, you might want to scan for swap. But also realistically, don't connect an old hard drive to these machines because <laughs> like it's gonna break anyway. So don't do that. Um, so ordinarily you can just say no here. Sometimes when I have used really old hardware, which is what I used to do um, until a few years ago during the pandemic, when pretty much all of my old hardware broke in within the space of, maybe two months. Um, back then I used to occasionally scan for bad blocks, but these days I just use newer hardware and I don't do that. 
Okay, so now we press enter and it asks us to choose our root partition. So I'm going to select SDA because that's the only one I have. Uh, format it, I'll pick EXT4. You can pick any of the others if you want, but I always use EXT4. Okay, all right. Okay, next you'll see it's uh, detected that we have the Slackware install media on the SD card. So it's asking us, do you want to use that? Well, yes, I do. That enables us to have a really nice and easy offline installation. I'm going to install everything here. So all, these are all the package sets. Uh, you can deselect them if you don't want them just by pressing space bar, etc. But because but because this is going to be a Slackware build machine, Slackware is built on a full Slackware system. So, uh, so I'm going to have to install everything. So on my servers, I'm quite discerning about what I install. So I won't install KDE. In fact, I'll go through the package sets and uninstall particular packages that I don't want. But again, because this is a build machine, I want to install everything. In the install guide, it recommends that you install everything. Um, first of all, because it's easier. And secondly, because Slackware doesn't have dependency management, it's one of the benefits and also potentially disbenefits. It's just the way it is. So we suggest that you install all the packages because that way you don't have any uh, dependency resolution issues. OK, so I'm now going to press enter and I will also select terse at this point. If you select full, then it displays the package information in these dialog boxes. But what happened is with as the hardware and the, um, the storage uh, got faster, the dialog, the dialog boxes would flash on the screen so quickly that in most cases you couldn't read the text on the screen. So the default was changed to terse so that you just get a single one line description of the package. OK, so it's now installing and this will take probably maybe 30 to 40 minutes. Um, so what we can do in the meantime is if we look at our keyboard here, we can press Alt and one of the, can re actually reach one of the arrow keys, or I could just press the F keys actually, it's easier, isn't it? So I just press Alt and F2 or F3 and you'll see now it says press Enter to activate this console. So now I'm still in the installer, but I have another virtual console available to me where I can um, do stuff. And this is one of the benefits of the Slackware installer. It it's quite a rich environment, and there are a number of different tools in there. Um, some networking tools, um, operating system management tools, um, sort of debug tools. We might even have a memory tester in there. I'll have, to, I'll have to check. But there's also the man pages and so on. So it's it's really quite a rich environment um, for obviously installing Slackware first and foremost, but also as it, but it also can act as a rescue environment. And during the porting of Slackware ARCH64, I used the installer quite extensively as part of the bootstrapping process. So um, the installer is a really nice feature-rich environment. Um, it's really a good one to have at your disposal. Now, to keep you entertained while Slackware installs, we have a little game called Brick Tick, like this. So you can type in Brick Tick here at the command line, and it's like a, a game called Arkanoid. So, uh, God, I have, okay, so you press space to start the game. And then basically, the idea is, is that you just have to uh, clear out each of the blocks at the top. And then you can also get these power ups that drop down from the top here. Some of them are, I think, they're power downs. So you, so you, you get penalized if you collect some of them. I don't know which one's which. Ah, oh no, I missed one. I used to love playing this game on the BBC Micro. In fact, actually, I wrote one in BASIC. I think it was from one of the um, magazines in the day. They used to have these, um, I mean, obviously, this was pre-internet. This was like in the 90, early 90s. And uh, you used to get these magazines, which would, ah, which would have um, uh, listings in the magazine. So you could actually type out the entire game or application. and. Um, one of which was a game called, it's called Breakout. That was what it was called, it's called Breakout. And it was a game on the Atari ST This is basically exactly the same as this, called Arkanoid, and it just had better graphics, basically. But this one is um, a really nice, simple game, and it can keep you occupied whilst Slackware installs.
I'm almost finished now, but come on, come on, come on. Ah, oh, I missed it. Come on, come on, come on. Some of the tricks as well is to try and bounce the ball off the edge of, of the chevron, you know, the, the, the angle, oh no, the angle brackets. Come on, come on. Let's see if I can get that power up. Oh, I've got one more life. Oh, come on. oh there we go. Oh yeah. Okay, cool. Right, so then, uh, once you've had enough of that game, we can then just use the key alt and function keys again to switch back to the installer screen and see how we're doing. Okay, so the packages have now installed and we're in the post installation phase of the Slackware installer. So it's now synchronizing the operating system initial RAM disk, which is the small environment that is used to bootstrap the OS proper. So inside the operating system initial RAM disk, it contains the kernel drivers to address you know, the, um, the SATA card and anything else on the board. And there is a tool called OS initrd MGR or OS-initrd-MGR, which allows you to manage this initial RAM disk so you can customize it, add in extra modules and so on. Okay, so we can now remove the Slackware installer. We don't need that anymore. I uh, don't need to do that. So yeah, we can recommend, the recommendation is no to configure console settings. To leave that as no. Now, at this stage, you can see it's asking to flash the bootloader. Now, because the version of the bootloader that we flashed at the start of this video is the same version as the one that's included within the installer, there is no need to flash it. But sometimes the initial bootloader is an older version than the version that's included in the installer. So it'll tell you that if that's the case and you should always flash it. But in this case, you'll see that it's not. So we don't need to flash it. And the default is no, so we'll just say no. We can configure the mouse here. You should just, just pick, I always pick just IMPS, but you could also pick USB connected mouse. <laughs> Either one works. Uh, host name, this is gonna be called, uh, this one is called Marvin. So we'll call him Marvin. Um, my domain. If you don't have a domain, as it says, use example.org or example.com. Uh, we use Network Manager, yes, and we will just enable the default services. I'll use RPC because I use that for NFS. Uh, no, I'll oh, do actually, yes, I do want custom screen fonts, T. So I'll pick this, this font here, uh, 732B. The name of this font is recommended in the install guide. It's also the same font that's in use right now, so it's this large font. Press one to accept the key map. No, I'll change my time to Londinium, which is down here somewhere. Uh, Vim is fine, KDE is fine, I'm not gonna use it anyway. Set the root password. Okay, and then exit. And we can just reboot like that. Okay, so the machine takes a moment to reboot and then we should see the bootloader. There we go. Yeah, the bootloader's back on the screen. And you can, whenever you see this bad, this warning bad CRC, you can ignore that. It's, uh, it's just because I haven't yet figured out how to write on the, on the images that we supply with Slackware, how to actually have a, a default environment that doesn't, that, that has the correct CRC. It's, <laughs> it's on the long to-do list and it's really not important. It's really cosmetic. The OS will boot. It will take slightly longer on the first boot uh, because it has to set up a few things in the OS, uh, but not too much longer. So the kernel's booting now. Well, the kernel's already booted, actually. It's loading the um, device drivers. And you can see the um, hard drive. The SSD is being uh, actively used there. Well, at least it was, anyway. 
And there we go, and the fan has spun up. So I'll log in as root now. Okay, now what I'm gonna do is, I've got a network cable over here, uh, which I'm gonna connect in. But I think, so I've got my network cable now connected in now. But I think, ah, okay, we've got a little issue with this fan here. Hmm, because it stops, okay. Some of these fans, I'm, I'm not sure if it's an issue with the boards themselves or whether it's the actual, well, I think it's something to do. Hmm, okay. So I've got that connected in there. Um, but I think that I have an issue with one of the, uh, with, with the wall socket, with the wall port. This is zero. Yeah, it's, it's, it's negotiated at 100 base TX, or 100 megs a second. It should be, gig, it should be a gigabit speed. Um, but yeah, I think that's a problem with the uh, wall socket. It's not a problem with the machine itself. I've had the same issue with other machines. I just need to fix the, uh, it, well, it could be the cable, I suppose, but it probably is the wall socket. Um, right, so what we're gonna do is, I'm gonna, because I want to soak test Right, because I want to soak test the uh, USB dongle in within the USB-C port, I'm going to make this ETH0. So if we insert this here, so if we insert, so let's just insert that like that. Okay, I'm, I don't need to connect a, a cable, I suppose I could actually. And let's disconnect it. Okay. Okay, so you can see we've got... So now you can see we've got two Ethernet adapters. ETH0 is the onboard one and ETH1 is the uh, USB-C um, dongle. I'm sure that ETH1 is also, yeah, 100 base. So I'll tell you what we'll do is because I anticipated this, I have, uh, because I anticipated this, I have a separate cable that's plugged directly into the switch. So let's just disconnect that and connect in this one instead. There we go. Now, how did that fare? There we go, 1000 base T, perfect. Now, yeah, so I think that's probably the wall socket I need to deal with at some point. I want this one to be ETH0. Okay, so the way that we'll do that is going to forward slash etc. udev rules.d. So edit that file there. Now, if we jump here at the end, you'll see that, uh, that the, the MAC address is this one here. Okay, so I've highlighted the MAC address, so it ends in 6D64. And if we do if config dash A, uh, 6D64. So ETH1 is the USB-C dongle, and its MAC address, is it called, or Ether, is Ethernet address as it's called here, uh, is ends in 6D64. Whereas the top one, which is the onboard one, ends in 0934, uh, 093F. Okay, so we want 6D64, and we should find that is here. So this UDEV rule maps onto the device that has this MAC address, which is which it has called, or named ETH1. So what we need to do is just change it to ETH0, like this. So I'll now reboot to make sure that it comes back up with the correct assignment. Okay, so it's booted up. Let's log in as root. Okay, config J. Hopefully we see 6D64, yep. And we should, in my eye tool, have it negotiated, yeah. So, so, yeah, this proves here that ETH0 has a link. And of course, the only one that's linked is the USB-C 
adapter and you can see that it um, has negotiated at one gigabit a second. So the reassignment using the UDEV rules has worked correctly. The next thing I need to do is, you see the speed of the fan? And this is something I should have done on the previous reboot and I forgot. Because this is a build machine, I'm going to increase the RPM speed, so the re revolutions per minute, to the fastest speed. The way to increase the fan RPM is it's currently it's static. So we go to etc. rc.d slash, uh, where is it? rc.platform.d and arch64. Okay. So there's a script called, uh, oh, there it is. So it's, that's the file. Sorry, the, the file is called this one. So, oh, by the way, if you don't know how to do this, in the console, you can, so you see here, so I've just selected the, so uh, I selected this line here, just double click on it, and it's done. And then to, to make it paste on the screen, you just simply press the middle mouse button if you have a, if you have a three button mouse. So you just go like, bump, and it pastes it in. So that's how you can use the mouse within the virtual console. Um, and it's also, I've noticed a lot of people don't know about the key maps. So for example, you see the way that the cursor is flashing on the end of the line. Well, if you press Control and A, now it's at the start of the line. And likewise, Control and E will take it back to the um, end of the line. And you can press Control and W, and it's deleted the entire thing. <laughs> so, and also I can do Nano, and then I can do control and Y and it pastes it back, paste back the uh, string that I just deleted. Professionally, I see people using Linux and they're making these circuitous routes to, to get through things when you've just got these, you know, um, keyboard shortcuts that really save you time. Okay, so we're gonna edit that file and we're gonna change the CPU speed and put it onto maximum speed, which is 255. On the Pinebook Pro, you can also here configure the LCD panel brightness. But of course, this has no bearing on the Rock Pro 64. The reason it's in this config file is because it's related to the RK3399 chipset or SOC. That's why it's in here. So we'll set the uh, maximum fan speed to 255, um, like that. And we can also... Now the thing about these scripts, it also tells you where they're called from. So they're called by rc.platform. So what I'm gonna do is to save rebooting, I'm just gonna see how we actually configure the thing. So now I'm just going to manually make the fan speed, uh, speed faster. Oh, there's the fan dev. There we go. Oh, I meant 255 actually. Put the maximum. There we go. <laughs> so if you can hear this, the difference in sound. So I've changed the speed of the fan to the maximum configuration. So then I've just manually increased the, the fan speed from the command line by um, writing the, the maximum value of the fan speed into the API. So I'm now rebooting the machine to ensure that it comes back up at the full speed. The reason is that this is a build machine or going to be a build machine and so it needs the fan on maximum otherwise the workload that this machine handles will damage the board the sock will overheat otherwise and the board will become damaged for certain um, so i'm just rebooting it now just to make sure that the configuration is taken so i can put the machine with the others out of sight and sound and be confident that the fan is um, running at maximum speed what I'd like to do in the future is have the fan controlled by software so that the speed of the fan is commensurate with the workload. So in other words, if it's not doing much, the machine, then the fan can lower down. And once the machine becomes busy again, the speed of the fan ratchets back up to the, um, to the top, or at least commensurate with the workload. At the moment though, the, the fan speed is static. Um, it's one of those things I haven't got around to looking at. But if you do know how to do that, let me know in the comments or in the uh, Linux questions forum or drop me a mail because um, I would like to, to, to make that change, but I just haven't got around to it and it's not been that important. So as you can see, the machine has rebooted and the fan is indeed at full 
RPM. All right, well, I hope you've enjoyed that. And I'll now finish off the uh, final configurations for the Rock Pro 64 so that I can move it onto the build network and set it up as the master builder. And once again, thanks for, for all your support and your donations, because that's what keeps the project going. Um, it takes money to buy the stuff and run it and all of that business. So again, thank you very much. And I'll see you in the next episode. Take care. Bye.